move to questions of Minister of Employment and Learning. We will start once again with oral questions. And I call Michelle McElveen. Question one, Mr Speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Executive's Pathway to Success Strategy for Young People Not in Employment, Education or Training introduced a number of initiatives to meet the wide-ranging needs of young people, including those who are in this category. The Collaboration and Innovation Fund supports five projects with a budget of almost £2 million, which specifically target care-experienced young people. Adele's local employment intermediate service, Lemus, is also available on an outreach basis to individuals with a common employability barrier. Uh, including care leavers. During the period uh, of the 2013-14 financial year, uh, Lemus providers received just over £2 million to deliver the service, and a similar budget is available this year. The European Social Fund is providing funding of £2.2 .2 million in 2014-15 for three projects that specifically target, but not exclusively, care-experienced young participants. The member will also be aware that the policy lead for work with looked after children lies with the Department of Health, Social Services and Public Safety. My department has a key role to play in promoting learning and skills, preparing people for work and supporting pathways to employment for looked after and care experienced young people. In this context, my department has been involved closely with the DHSSPS and the Health and Social Care Board and Trusts, and we are working to improve the education, training and employment outcomes for young people in care or leaving care. In particular, the Career Service has, for some considerable time, been working with trusts and others in an attempt to ensure that these vulnerable young people have, ex have access to the right advice about their future. Number six and number ten has been withdrawn. Michelle McElveen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the Minister for his comprehensive response in relation to that, um, particularly around those children, young, or those young people who um, are in, in, the, in the care system. Can you advise how much funding is perhaps made available to Queen's University and the University of Ulster in broadening their access, and how much is specifically spent on care experience young people? Well, she, she does uh, raise an, an important point, and it is worth stressing that um, access and widening participation is a, is a key objective of the, the department, and that includes um, vulnerable uh, young, young people. Um, th those budgets um, do amount to several million pounds per year for the, for the inst institutions. I can't give the, a precise breakdown for those that relate to care experience young people, and in any event, they'll be swept up in terms of a general um, outreach uh, and also in terms of the support uh, that's made available uh, to, to such young people. It's also worth making reference as well to, to our training for success which is also sensitive to the needs of care experienced young people in the sense that they have a longer eligibility uh, to stay on, on such programmes. Pat Ramsey. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I welcome the Minister's responses to date. The whole needs area has been an area which the Committee of Employment and Learning has been very engrossed in for some time, and the key element of that was tracking and the retention of data. Could the Minister outline to the House of these funding mechanisms for young people not in education, employment or training? How many young people with learning or physical disabilities have been through these schemes? Well, I'm happy to come back to, to the member with a, with a detailed set of figures in terms of the headcount uh, that have gone through the, the, different, the different strands. Uh, it is important to, to remember that across the department we have a number of different interventions uh, that will be working uh, with uh, vulnerable uh, young people. Some of those will be the, the specific programmes under the Pathways to Success uh, uh, strategy, uh, most notably the Collaboration and, and Innovation Fund. Uh, but similar young people will also be accessed in some of our other uh, programmes, including some of the European Social Fund and, and, and indeed uh, mainstream uh, training programmes as, as well. So there's a very broad reach um, in, in that regard. Hard, but it is important that we do all that we can to ensure that we are maximising uh, the potential for everyone uh, to engage in society. And where appropriate, we will invest in resources to address particular barriers that are preventing some people from uh, developing and engaging to their full potential. Uh, Danny Kenahan, Mr. Kenahan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answers so far. But would the Minister clarify how the introduction of the Together Building a United Community? will affect or has affected his department's initiatives? Well, the main way um, it will impact is the, um, the programme uh, for the uh, United Youth, um, which will be an overarching framework um, which will uh, cover a range of existing uh, programmes 
on a revamped basis and also some new interventions as well. Um, my department is now uh, leading on behalf of the executive and working in close collaboration with other departments around the design of that and we, we hope to be in a position to give some clarity in the near future as to what, what the way forward is going to be in this regard. It is worth bearing in mind that this is a, is a hybrid of uh, volunteering, uh, good relations, community relations and empl employability and it is designed to, to engage with a, a wide range of young people from a different uh, set of, of, of backgrounds and also a different set uh, of, of particular training needs. William Humphrey. Mr Humphrey. Thank you Mr Speaker. Question number two please. Um, Mr Speaker, that question has been transferred to DFP. It should have been factored through. Oliver McMillan. Uh, never a three. Question three. Um, I very much welcome the uh, committee's in inquiry. Um, as requested by the Committee for Employment and Learning, I responded to, all its, its, I responded to its call for evidence uh, by the original 21st of March uh, 2014 deadline, uh, although the deadline has been subsequently extended to the 30th of June. The response provided uh, information on issues raised under the inquiry's term for reference. In addition, it included comprehensive information on the opportunities offered by my department and its key delivery partners. I also offered to provide further updates on the committee about any significant developments on issues which evolved during the course of its inquiry, in addition to any verbal updates that the committee may seek from my department. Can I thank the Minister for his answer? Is the Minister of the opinion that much more needs to be done to uh, provide opportunities for this severely disadvantaged group of people? Uh, yes. Um, I, I guess worthwhile looking at the, the overall context in this regard to see how different, different interventions uh, will, will fit in. Um, for, first of all, um, my department is conducting a review of the disability employment uh, service uh, with a view to having in place uh, a draft strategy by the end of this year. That looks at the very particular uh, issues around access uh, to, to employment. We have a range of existing interventions um, on, on a broader basis that my department are, is also uh, involved with, including uh, access to further education, access to careers uh, advice. Beyond that, there's a, there's a much wider, essentially cross-executive issue as to how we better manage transitions from those, for those young people who are leaving um, school um, at, uh, at essentially 19 um, with a special uh, educational needs uh, background uh, to ensure that they have a range of adequate services available uh, to them. Um, the executive uh, subcommittee uh, that uh, monitors the implementation of the Bamford report on, into mental health and uh, learning disability issues has established um, a, a mechanism uh, by which we are looking at this particular issue. Um, the departments so far have, have stated what uh, provision they currently have. Uh, we're currently con conducting a gap analysis in that regard uh, to see what more can be done. And in the near future, we, we will sit down uh, across departments uh, to, dis to discuss what more can be done and whose responsibi responsibility it will be to address those issues. Swan, Mr. Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And just to pick the Minister up there, he said the Executive Subcommittee is looking at the gaps that are going to be there through Bamford, from the Bamford report. Has he spoke to the Health Minister at all in regard to the change that's coming in uh, day centres, where they propose they're only going to accept those with severe behavioural needs or severe medical needs, and there's going to be an entire cohort of individuals there that won't be able to access day centres? So has he spoke to the Health Minister about that? Yes, I thank the, the Chair for, for that question, uh, and that is very much part uh, of the landscape uh, that uh, is before us um, at, at present. Um, it's important that we seek to reconcile what is the policy direction in terms of health and also what can uh, reasonably be done by a department such as my, as my own, which has a focus around skills and en engaging people uh, with, the, with the labour market. Um, we need to, to work out in terms of that essentially gap between those two different responsibilities as to how best we can service the needs uh, of, of, of young people. I think what annoys parents more than anything else is a situation where they find that Department A says this is, these are our responsibilities, Department B says uh, th these are my responsibilities, and they're almost stuck in the middle, not knowing where they can turn to. So it's important that we have a full spectrum of interventions, and, and those are joined up. And what the, the, the Minister of Health is doing is very relevant to the discussions that are happening within the executive subcommittee and that we do hope to bottom out uh, what it should be a comprehensive uh, suite of interventions uh, in the very near future. John Dalek. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, would the Minister agree with me that 16 years into the new Assembly, it's time for departments to stop arguing whose responsibility it is for people with special needs? And will he, in fact, Mr. Speaker, become the uh, voice of those people who haven't benefited from the equality that was enshrined in the Good Friday Agreement? Well, um, I, I'm happy to assure the member that I'm, I'm happy to be a voice uh, in that regard, but we, we need mul multiple voices um, from other departments uh, and indeed members of the Assembly themselves uh, to, to fully uh, address uh, th this issue. I can also reassure him that the issue has been taken seriously uh, and that departments uh, are seized of the importance uh, of this issue. And uh, like all members, we are very acutely aware of the deep concerns uh, that parents have around that transition phase uh, and the, the, the move from the relative certainty of, of, uh, of a school setting uh, to the uncertainty as to what, as to what comes next. Uh, my department has uh, stepped forward to, to coordinate uh, that particular discussion on behalf of the uh, Executive Subcommittee, but there are other departments with, with responsibility as well, in particular um, OFM, DFM have a cross-cutting responsibility in relation to disability issues on behalf of the Executive, but there is good communication between the departments as we seek to fully address the issue. Mrs. Cochran. Mrs. Cochran. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number four, please. Do you believe in the importance of evidence-based policy making? In recognition of the importance of learning from international best practice for the ongoing review of youth training, I recently undertook a visit to Denmark, building upon a previous visit to the Netherlands. The key lessons I brought back from the visit include that work-based learning with an employer is a key element of provision, with learning alternating regularly between college-based and workplace-based approaches. Importance is placed on, on numeracy and literacy, and funding arrangements are, are in place to reward colleges for performance and employers for engagement. I was impressed with the role that Denmark's Central Trade Council and sector-based trade committees play in determining their vocational curriculum, which is securing a much simpler qualification system than, than, than what we have presently in Northern Ireland. Such structures have ensured that the, that the industry leads the development of qualifications to match the required competencies for each occupation. The visit also provided useful insights into ways of re-engaging young people and promoting a positive image of vocational training. Amongst other things, the Danish approach included taster courses for those currently not engaged in either work or training, and the provision of dedicated mentors to assist young people with issues not directly connected to their studies. There is recognition in Denmark that a system is not perfect, and I was interested in the steps being taken to improve the image of vocational learning and give it parity of esteem with academic roots. I will, I will make a statement to the Assembly later in this month, which will provide an update on progress of the review. These key findings will inform the review of youth training interim report, which will be published in the early autumn of 2014 for public consultation. Thank you, and I thank the Minister um, for his answer. Could the Minister maybe give us um, a little bit more of an indication of how these lessons are being applied to the current review of youth training here in Northern Ireland? Well, the, the Member will appreciate that we are currently conducting uh, this review of, of youth training. Uh, and what we're seeking to do is to ensure that we have a, a fit-for-purpose offer for those young people who are uh, leaving school without the necessary qualifications at this stage uh, to progress uh, either into work or into an apprenticeship um, or into uh, further education or, or higher, indeed higher education. Um, at present, we have a range of different programmes that seek to address that particular cohort of young people. Uh, at, at this time, um, the, their level of, of performance in terms of, of outcomes isn't as, perhaps as strong as it, as it could be. And also, there's a sense that it, it isn't as relevant to the needs of employers and the economy as, as a whole as, as it could be. So there's very clear lessons from Denmark as to how we better uh, engage employers uh, to ensure that the needs of the economy are taken in, into consideration. It's also a very strong focus on literacy and numeracy, which have to be fundamental to ensuring that all young people uh, have those essential skills uh, that are now absolutely vital uh, for the world of work in any aspect that someone wants, wants to consider. Also, the, the strong role of mentoring young people as well is, is very important. Uh, we have to provide that, that rounded uh, support for young people, almost in the sense that to, to replicate some of the pastoral care that young people who actually remain in school uh, and also the access to curricular, extra curricular, curricular activities that they would also be obtaining is somehow replicated in the, the wider uh, youth training offer that we will hopefully have in Northern Ireland in the very near future. Campbell. Mr. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in the Minister's trip both to the Netherlands and Denmark, 
Um, did he come across the issue that affects quite a number of communities in Northern Ireland, where there are the hard-to-reach communities, there are young people in working-class estates for whom outreach programmes and attempts to get them into uh, other programmes are proving very, very difficult to be successful? Did he get any information there that he can apply to Northern Ireland? Yes, um, the member raises a very uh, valid uh, point. Um, we have to be very inclusive in terms of the, 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 the offers that we put in place and seek to maximise participation uh, from particularly marginalised young people um, who have maybe motivational issues or, or otherwise not encouraged to engage in the training opportunities uh, that are out there uh, for them. Um, I think, particularly from the visit to the Netherlands, um, that there is a very important lesson in terms of the use uh, of how the, the community volunteer sector can work uh, at a grassroots level in encouraging young people to, to come forward and also about often shaping the offer to meet the, the, the local circumstances uh, that, that, that prevail. It's also about creating a culture where vocational training is seen as of being, of being valid and as valid in many respects as more traditional um, academic routes. And they will actually raise the status of that and in turn link that into people's aspirations. It's also um, worth stressing as well that we, we have a lot of young people who are currently um, not uh, succeeding in, in a school-based environment. That does not mean that they don't have the aptitude to engage in, in the world of work and indeed many of those young people ha are actually very talented uh, in, in many respects but maybe just haven't been encouraged uh, to, to bring their talents to bear. And it's important that we show the value of vocational training as, as a means by, by which we draw out those the talents of, of young people and in turn that, that actually creates a, a, vir a virtuous loop where they actually gain their own qualifications and put it in very simple terms uh, uh, perhaps a, a young person who's interested in uh, being a, um, a mechanic um, and likes tinkering with cars or, or motorcycles and um, they may not necessarily initially see the value of sitting down and getting their miles qualification but if they want to progress in terms of, of doing that um, they will need to achieve that miles qualification but the vocational training may encourage that young person to actually sit down and, and ensure they get their, their basic qualifications Sandra O'Brien. Mrs O'Brien. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, how does the primary and post-primary education systems in Denmark compare to ours, and how will they be impacted uh, if a Danish-based model of youth training were to be used here in Northern Ireland? Well, in most of um, continental Europe, um, th there are very clearly established um, academic and vocational routes. Um, at times, they will be more differentiated from each other in, in certain jurisdictions and others there will be a, a much uh, tighter uh, or the ability to interchange uh, b between the two. Um, th there will be a much greater parity of esteem uh, between those types of, of pathways so there wouldn't be the same degree of hierarchy that we see in Northern Ireland society where the academic pathway is seen as being the, 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 the greater or more important one than the vocational pathway and there's almost a, a stigma applied to those who are doing vocational training. So what we're trying to do through both our review of apprenticeships and uh, youth training is to address some of those perceptions and to ensure that we encourage uh, people to pursue what is the most appropriate pathway uh, for, for themselves to play a full role in society and also in our economy. Question number five. Um, steps to success is, is my department's main programme for assisting unemployed and economically inactive people to find and keep work. Steps to success builds on the success of Steps to Work and will increase the flexibility to develop an individually designed programme to prepare participants to find employment. The procurement of Steps to Success has been carried out by my department in conjunction with the Central Procurement Directorate of the Department of Finance and Personnel. The procurement is in two stages. Stage one was completed in November 2013, selecting six organisations to bid to deliver the programme in each of three contract areas. Subsequently, one organisation withdrew in the southern contract area. After discussion with the central procurement director, it was agreed to proceed with the competition in the southern contract area with five bidding organisations. Organisations in stage two are required to, to design a comprehensive service delivery model designed to meet standards set by the department and service guarantees for each category of participant. Bidders are required to develop a compre comprehensive supply chain to enable a quality service to be delivered to all participants throughout the contract area. Stage two of the procurement is underway with detailed bids to deliver the programme in the three contract areas presently being evaluated by, by, by my officials. 
It is, it is anticipated that I will be able to announce the results of the, the successful bidders this month with the programme commencing in September 2014. Officials are also working to ensure that the required legislative, administrative, governance and financial systems are implemented to enable steps to success to, to be delivered to a high standard from the start of the programme. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the Minister will be aware that there is some major local concern around the provision of the programme. And given the highlighted poor track record of some of the UK providers uh, in, pro uh, in other programmes here, what consideration is being given uh, uh, to smaller local providers who may miss out on, on this uh, exercise? Well, it is worth stressing that the procurement that uh, has been conducted um, has been uh, uh, conducted um, very much in line with the advice uh, from uh, CPD. Um, we have a level playing field in terms of the bids uh, that, that were made, uh, and a, a select list was drawn up uh, based at stage one based upon responses received. Um, Organisations who didn't necessarily meet that threshold um, weren't, uh, that, that didn't imply that they weren't up to uh, delivering this. That the, however, it was a competitive process. Only really a certain number were going to get through uh, to, to the second stage. At this point, um, there are opportunities in terms of the supply chain for organisations um, uh, across the board. And indeed, it is a prerequisite uh, of bids that the, 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 the future league contractors will have a supply chain and they don't seek to deliver uh, the programme solely uh, by, through, through themselves. Um, so we, I'm satisfied that we will have rigorous supply chains uh, in place um, that will create a wealth of opportunities uh, for a wide range of organisations. Rosalind McCurley. Um, can I ask the Minister, um, can he give a guarantee to small local providers who tell me and other um, members that they will go out of business as a result of how this procurement process has worked out because the work will not filter down and will be administered largely by the organisations across the water who don't have local knowledge and local engagement with local people? Or am I good? Well, I, I can't give the member any specific guarantees about any particular uh, individual um, or organisations, um, but I, all I can do is to reiterate uh, what I've said to, 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 the, to the last member, Mr McKinney, um, that the, the lead contractors will be required to ensure that they have a, a very comprehensive supply chain in place, and within that there will be a considerable number of opportunities for locally based organisations. Um, we are fully aware of the importance of, of that local knowledge, and that's why the, the programme has been designed um, as such. But it's also important that we bear in mind that the rationale for steps to success isn't about the interests per se of the, the, of the delivery organisations. This is about actually ensuring that we have better outcomes in terms of, of, of moving people who are unemployed into employment. That's how we will judge the success of this programme. And throughout that, the way we've designed this, this scheme um, has, that, has that objective very much in mind to ensure that we have a step change in the level of performance from what has been a very good programme in terms of steps to work to have an excellent programme in terms of steps to success, because ultimately we have a duty to all of our constituents to tackle the scourge of unemployment. Mr Copeland. Thank you very much. Um, Mr Speaker, could I ask the Minister, um, is he anticipating at this stage any legal action on behalf or led by the unsuccessful bidders, and what steps will he take to ensure, or can he give us assessment of the impact of any such actions on the introduction of steps to success? Um, I can assure the member that I am satisfied that um, great care and attention has been given uh, by my officials and the CPD in terms of the handling uh, of this uh, procurement. Um, it is a very big um, procurement scheme uh, and uh, we've had a lot of people who have been spending a lot of time to ensure that we, we get this right and that we, we do indeed uh, follow uh, procedures uh, to ensure that we are complying uh, with all of the necessary requirements. Question number six has been withdrawn. Raymond McCartney. Mr. McCartney is not in his place. Dr. Alistair MacDonald. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Question eight, please. Um, I gave a commitment to the House on the 6th of May 2014 that I would launch a consultation on zero hours contracts. I also indicated that my department would conduct further research to establish the extent of the use of zero hours contracts in Northern Ireland. 
It is my intention that the planned consultation will be launched before the summer recess and will seek views on a number of areas where action may be required. These include exclusivity clauses, the right for employees on GRR's contracts to request a move to fixed term contract and the transparency of these type of contracts. My department will also take forward a range of qualitative and quantitative projects as part of the consultation process. Dr. Alistair MacDonald. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. But could I ask him, he has mentioned to us making a start before the summer recess, and I appreciate that. But you, you will recall that I have spoken before on this issue. How, can he give us any idea how the programme or a programme might roll out and how we might reach an end point and a result? Well, well, the member will appreciate that um, several months ago he asked me what was a, a topical um, question in the, in the Assembly, and um, I perhaps gave him, uh, unusual for this Assembly, a, a direct answer and said that we were actually looking at the issue and, we, in principle, we were prepared uh, to, to move on. Um, Whenever I answered that question, we were at a very early stage in terms of development because I simply at that stage accepted in principle that we would be doing a consultation um, on the issue and potentially uh, arising from that uh, moving towards uh, legislation. In terms of the particular timescale moving forward, um, uh, it is my intention that we would have a consultation uh, out uh, before the summer recess. That consultation would then unfold uh, over the next number of months. Um, I would then uh, bring uh, the outcome of that consultation to, to the executive um, with a view to seeking agreement um, on the, the way forward. In parallel to this, it is my intention to bring a, another paper to the executive um, in relation to the wider employment law review. Um, it, that uh, exercise does anticipate uh, that we will have uh, primary uh, legislation uh, to take into account the outcome of that review. So it would be my intention that we would try to join up these two processes in due course and that that, that, that employment law bill itself uh, may contain um, provisions relating to zero hours contracts. The member will also be conscious that in Great Britain they've, also, they've had a consultation on GRR's contracts which closed um, earlier on this year. There's something like 37,000 responses uh, to that. Um, this is now the, the final year of, of, of Westminster and indeed the Queen's speech, as the member will, will know, is happening on, on Wednesday. So we will watch with interest to see if there's any plans for legislation in, in Great Britain. Um, in that context, we may be the, be the first jurisdiction in these islands, therefore, to take action on zero hours contracts if indeed the consultation process here uh, does indeed warrant us taking action. So, but we will take seriously the outcome of that process and see what we do need to do. Leslie Creed. Question number nine, Mr. Speaker. Um, firstly, I would advise the member that the department leading on welfare reform is the Department for Social Development. Uh, my department is not responsible for welfare reform. Once the way forward in Northern Ireland is agreed, we will become a strategic delivery partner for a universal credit and will be responsible for, for providing a face-to-face -face work focused service for uh, universal credit claimants. Taking account of the potential impacts of welfare reform, my department has developed a resourcing strategy that will ensure we have the correct number of staff at the appropriate grades and with the relevant skills and competences to deliver services to a high standard. My department is currently awaiting claimant uh, volumetric information from the Department of Work and Pensions before it can calculate staff numbers. I thank the, the Minister for that, and I am aware that there is an overlap. Minister, one of the, the outworkings of welfare reform is that more and more people have been refused employment support allowance and been transferred to job seekers despite having medical evidence that they're unfit for work. How do you see that actually panning out in the future? Well, again, um, that, that process of, of, and that assessment is, is a matter for the um, Department of, of um, Social Development in terms of the, the work capability uh, assessments. Uh, but it is something we, we, we again, we factor in in terms of, of the number uh, of clients that we are responsible for um, as a department. Uh, it is something we do keep under close um, monitoring, uh, and um, the employment service itself um, has close on a thousand staff in total. Um, it would be not right for me not to acknowledge the, 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 the real working commitment of the staff um, at present, particularly as they have been dealing with a particular um, uh, peak in terms of the claimant count uh, over the past number of years. Now, thankfully, that is uh, falling and falling quite, quite rapidly, uh, but it has been well in excess of what has been the, the, uh, the, 
the, the, the anticipated number of, of cases to be handled uh, by the department. But we do take into account all of these different shifts in terms of different programmes and the, the impact of, in terms of the, uh, the pressures in terms of employment service staff. Before we move on to topical questions of the Minister, in relation to question number two uh, from Mr Humphrey, who has left the Chamber, can I say to the Minister that no indication was given uh, to transfer the question? And we have checked with the uh, DFP on this particular issue. Um, it might be useful that uh, the Minister would take it upon himself just to make sure that Mr Humphrey receives a written, question, uh, written answer uh, to his question. Just to clarify and, and clarify that particular issue, um, Stephen Mitry, we move to topicals. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the minister if he could outline uh, what plans there are for the redevelopment of the Southern Regional College campuses at Lurgan, Portadown, and Banbridge? Um, Thank you, and Mr. Speaker. First of all, I'll just put, up, put on record uh, a pass on formal apology to Mr. Humphrey for what has been a confusion between my department and, and DFP, and, and we will, of course, provide a, a full written answer to him uh, in, in that regard. With reference to Mr. Boutre's um, uh, question, um, we have received a, um, a business case uh, from uh, Southern Regional College which relates to redevelopments for both um, Armagh, uh, Banbridge, and uh, Craig Avon. Um, we have accepted uh, that there has been a, uh, an underinvestment in the Southern Regional College area uh, rel relative to other parts um, of, of Northern Ireland. Um, the member will be aware that um, th there is already uh, £1 million uh, allocated uh, by the Minister of, of Finance uh, in relation to initial works uh, in relation to, to Banbridge. Uh, it, it is hoped that we will have clarity, in particular in relation to Armagh, uh, very soon, because the issues around site uh, are, are, are fairly well um, advanced uh, and, and fairly clear. In relation to Craig Avon, um, it would be our intention to, see, to seek to, to amalgamate uh, the, the existing um, Lurgan and Portadown uh, campuses in terms of a new purpose-built uh, facility uh, on a site to be identified in the, in the Craig Avon area. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for the uh, response. I was going to ask him in relation to Craig Avon, could he be site specific, but I don't think he's going to do that today. Can I at least ask him, uh, will he give consideration to accessibility of attendees at any new campus and especially of rural dwellers? Well, I, I, I was going to say that um, we're not quite sure which roundabout it's going to be all at uh, just yet, so uh, take, take your pick. And, uh, and any, any advice that the, the member uh, wishes to, to offer in that regard would, would, be, would be particularly welcome. But can I say that actually one of the, the, the motivating issues behind the new campus is to have a, a purpose-built facility that meets the needs of the entire community uh, in that area and um, has purpose-built facilities that are modern and, and, and indeed that are, that are first class uh, in, in nature. In order for this to work, we have to work to ensure that we are attracting people in from all areas. So I'm more than happy to take back his comments around uh, rural accessibility and to ensure that we are uh, ensuring that everyone has the, the, the ability to freely access uh, this resource, which I think will be a major asset uh, to uh, third level education in, in the Craig Avon part of Northern Ireland. Tom Elliott. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, I wonder if the Minister is aware of any schemes, uh, whether the Steps to Work scheme or any other scheme provided by his department uh, that uh, allowed political parties to use the employees to canvass during last month's elections? Well, well, first of all, I mean, this has been a matter of a number of written questions from the, the members' um, party, party colleagues. Can I say that? Um, some of the, the, the schemes, um, particularly steps to work, um, have safeguards in this regard. It, it did come to our light that some of the more um, recent interventions did not have specific uh, safeguards in that regard. That omission has now been, been, been rectified. Um, I am aware that uh, a number of uh, political parties have made use of the different schemes uh, that are uh, available um, across uh, my department, particularly for working with, with young people. Uh, and can I welcome the fact that they are engaging with, the, with those schemes and offering young people uh, that, that opportunity. Um, I have no direct evidence uh, of any um, political party or any MLA um, using any of those schemes uh, to ask or to require a young person to engage directly in political canvassing, however. Um, 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And the Minister's answer, I suppose, is on one hand admitting uh, that, that they are being used, but on the other saying that he has no evidence of it. So, on, on that basis, has the Minister any evidence that the Alliance Party used any of those employees uh, to be out canvassing for the elections? Well, I, I can give a, 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 a categorical no in terms of the second part of what he's saying. And just to clarify the distinction that, that I was making, that um, we are aware of MLAs and political parties using the schemes to uh, engage young people uh, for a, a range of activities, which I presume uh, are legitimate. Uh, there's no evidence that the, the particular issue that he raised of political canvassing um, has been something that those young people have been engaged with. Michael Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister if he could give the House some detail of the new division set up within his department um, to deal with youth policy and strategy? Yeah, I'm grateful to the member for, for her question. Uh, we have had a, a minor internal uh, reorganisation. This brings together a number of particular uh, policy development areas uh, to ensure that they are uh, properly uh, integrated. These include um, the current review of apprenticeships, uh, the review of youth training, um, the, also the, um, the, the work on the uh, United Youth Programme, and finally the work we're doing in terms of uh, economic uh, inactivity. Uh, hopefully this reflects the fact that there is a considerable degree of linkage between uh, these different uh, initiatives and it's important that we have a joined up approach in terms of the, the same senior people and indeed other members of staff um, having a proper knowledge of, the, of how they inter, inter, interlock with, e with each other and to ensure that we are adopting as much innovation in terms of policy making as possible. And I thank the Minister for his response. Um, could I ask the Minister if, to detail what discussions he's had with other departments in relation to um, this new division and also what budget he has allocated for it to carry out its work? The main, the main focus of, of discussions with other departments um, largely relate to what are cross-cutting, and the main um, aspects in that regard would be, first of all, that United Youth itself is a cross-cutting um, part uh, of the executive's work and, uh, as it flows from the Together Building a United Community um, document. The member will also be aware that the economic and activity strategy is something that has been led uh, by um, my department in conjunction uh, with the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment uh, on behalf of the, the, of the executive as, as a whole. Um, in terms of the specific way departments are, are structured, those are very much matters uh, for ministers and permanent secretaries, uh, but uh, hopefully th th this um, revised structure will make it easier for us to engage with other departments on areas that are, are indeed cross-cutting. Can I ask the Minister for his assessment of the most recent labour mar market statistics? Well, I think it, the, the, the latest set of figures are encouraging, um, but clearly there is a lot more work uh, to, to be done. Um, in particular, we are seeing a very consistent fall in terms of the, the, the claimant count. I think that we're now talking about the, the, the biggest consistent uh, fall f uh, in terms of the of consecutive number of months uh, for approaching 15, almost 20, 20 years. That's a, a sign of the degree of recovery that's, that's happening in terms of, of our economy. But we also have to recognise that we are um, moving in the right direction from a, a, a low base in terms of employment. Uh, we've ha we have had uh, consider considerable problems with unemployment uh, over the past uh, no number of years. And within that, there are particular issues around both long-term unemployment and also youth unemployment. That is why some of the very particular interventions that we are designing, whether it is steps to success or whether it is the pathways to success and youth employment scheme that we have put in place to try to address those particular angles. I thank the Minister for his answer, but would he agree with me that despite the falling number of people claiming job seekers allowance, that our economy is now dominated by people who may be in work but are underemployed, underpaid and uh, suffer from high levels of immigration? Well, I think this is an issue that is maybe um, affecting a number of countries in Europe and elsewhere in the world um, about um, what maybe some people call a jobless recovery or in other, in other ways um, the problem of, of underemployment. I think the way we can maybe reassure the member is that we um, do see a recovery in terms of the level of, of demand. Um, we are expecting uh, a lot more pressure in terms of jobs over the, 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 rest, the remaining part of this decade and indeed through to 2030. 
There are some surveys that are suggesting that we have the potential to create about uh, another 28 to 30,000 jobs uh, through to 2030, and that's outside the context of a lower level of corporation tax. If we were to achieve that particular power, subject to putting in place other supporting interventions, we could, could potentially double the num number of jobs to be created uh, by, uh, by 2030 to almost 60,000. So there's a real prize out there. So you see that there is a degree of, of pressure uh, for, for, for employment. Where a difficulty may arise lies in a mismatch between supply and demand. And that's why it's so important that we invest in the right skill levels at the right level of skills and also in the right uh, particular sectors uh, of the economy. And that's why it's so important that we're doing things like the, the review of careers while we're investing in apprenticeships, uh, while we're investing in STEM places at university. Ian McCarthy. Mr. McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the, the Minister uh, for to give the Assembly a quick comment on the recent unfortunate stabbing incident that took place at the Belfast Metropolitan College recently. Can I thank the, the member uh, for his question? And clearly, this is something that um, there's a lot of interest in, in, in the community ar around uh, this incident. Um, a on 22nd of May, uh, a confrontation did take place between two uh, students um, at the Millfield campus uh, of Belfast Metropolitan College. Uh, one student sustained serious injuries and remains in hospital in a serious but stable condition, and the other student has been arrested uh, and was later, was later bailed. The college immediately deployed first aid to the injured parties, and indeed the ambulance service arrived within 10 minutes of being notified. Uh, the PSNI were also called to the scene and secured the, 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 the vicinity of the campus. Um, can I say that BMC reacted very quickly to make counselling services available to staff and students at the Millfield campus and also to, to liaise closely uh, with the families concerned? I think it's also referencing the, the, the important interventions that were made uh, by the, the lecturing and other staff in the college and how proactive uh, they were in this, in this regard. That's not, perhaps not something that has entered the public domain, but I think it's appropriate that we give recognition to the sheer professionalism of all of the staff in terms of how they responded uh, to the incident. I think it's worth stressing that this is a, was an unprecedented um, incident that occurred within our FE sector. Um, Hopefully it is very much a one-off with very particular circumstances that led uh, to, to it happening. Uh, obviously, we will have to take into account um, lessons uh, to be learned uh, for the future. Um, but I think it's important that we do re recognise that our systems did uh, work well in terms of dealing with, with ho hopefully what uh, will be a very isolated case. Here, McCarthy. Uh, thank the Minister for his very detailed response. Uh, perhaps he could give the, um, the Assembly his estimation of what implications this has for future policy uh, in relation to um, the incident. Um, well, again, I thank the member for, for the question. And while um, it's appropriate that we do congratulate all of those involved for the, the, the manner in which they responded uh, to uh, the situation, I think in any situation like this, there always need to be a lessons learned um, exercise to ensure that, based upon that, that, this experience, that um, our policies are reviewed to see if, if there are things that can be done better. Uh, and indeed, risk management is also deployed to ensure uh, that. Um, that the policies themselves are properly proofed uh, in, in that regard. Um, and I'm sure BMC will be doing this, and I know that they, they have already uh, instigated an internal review around that lessons learned uh, process. What I would want to say is I don't want um, our FE colleges to be turning into some sort of uh, facility with a lot of security around them. We want to have a very welcoming environment for students and, and others alike. We want to ensure that we are attracting people to go in, in, into FE. So it's important that we do put places, places in its proper context. Craig. Mr. Craig. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Minister, we have been in correspondence before about neutral environments within our universities. Um, I would just like an update on what action has been taken to reduce some of the intimidation that has been going on in Jordanstown in particular. Well, the, the member um, will, will be aware that the, the university um, has put in place a working group uh, to look at uh, good relations issues um, in, in relation to uh, its campuses. Um, that has a, a range of different stakeholders, including a number of, of different um, student voices. Um, and I am um, confident that um, they will reach uh, some degree of understanding in terms of what is the most appropriate way forward in terms of, of, of the use um, of, of perhaps different, different symbols and, and, and uh, 
uh, and the particular issue that the, the member uh, raised, raised initially. Um, can I again put, put on record that in themselves, the, the people wearing a GAA top or, 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 or another type of sporting jersey should be viewed as being not conducive to good relations or indeed to, to a shared campus. What is, o is always important is the context in which these things uh, are, are occurring. The latest advice from the Quality Commission is that, um, in particular in relation to campuses, that, it, that a good harmonious environment does not necessarily mean to, to be a neutral environment. Uh, so that we have to have a very delicate balance between people's right to expression uh, of their identity and, and their interests. And, the, 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 uh, the need for good relations in terms of different working environments or educational environments. And that's why it's important that the university themselves work out what is an appropriate policy for their own particular circumstances. Of course, that concludes uh, question time.